Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Saturday live stream. So we got a lot of things to talk about. So let's just jump right into it. So the first thing, as the title and the thumbnail suggests, we're going to talk about the Ethereum ETF and just what's going on. And uh, there's a couple of things to, to make note of. And I think this is actually a positive, and we'll get to that why. But this article, Coindesk or Cointelegraph, Bitcoin and Ether uh, disappoint bulls on ETF confirmation. And I got to tell you, it was we kind of knew it was going to happen like this as soon as the ETF, you know, there was uh, even even if everything got approved, it, we knew it was going to be a little bit of a lag, just like what happened with the Bitcoin ETF, buy the rumor, sell the news, that type of thing. But there's also some other parts behind it. And even like on my Twitter account, I or X, I make fun of it. And I, you know, I said, hey, you know, what the heck's going on with this uh, major, major massive rally that's coming? And of course, we all talked about it instead of these things are going to take time, just like with the Bitcoin ETF and just like whatever ETF comes forward. So when I take a look at this, I'm like, it's just par for the course. The question is, why is it a little bit of a laggard? And are we all the way approved? And we are not. So this was a piece, James Seifert and Eric Latunas, dedicated ETF analysts at Bloomberg. And they went back and forth about why this is. And uh, James says it right. And I, I don't think I, I mentioned this because I've been off for a couple of days or so. I just want to get back into it. And he says, to be clear, this doesn't mean that we'll begin trading tomorrow, unlike the Bitcoin ETF, because it's had S1 and 19B4 approval. Uh, for this one, uh, ETFs or the, the Ethereum ETF got approved on the first side, but it was not approved on the S1 documents, which is going to take time. We're expecting to take a couple of weeks, but could take longer. And uh, he says, you know, this could be a couple of weeks. And he says, and it could up to be up to five months in some examples. And then Eric Balchunas, he comes, comes in and says, no, I think it'll be a couple of weeks. We're going to fast track this for whatever reason. You can say it's because there's an Ethereum futures already and they're going to fast track it. You can say it's because of a political agenda. Whatever it is, they're saying it's probably going to be in mid-June. But he did say it's just a guess, though. So it's anybody's anybody's concept about what we could actually go through. And to kind of break this down, there was a good piece from uh, Gabriel Shapiro. And he says, this is the alpha and why ETH isn't mooning at all. Only the 19 before is approved, not the S1s. And this was interesting. Approval was by division of trading markets on delegated authority within the SEC. So it wasn't the SEC commissioners like we had before with the Bitcoin ETF, where he had a vote of three to two, where Gary Gensel actually broke the vote. And he actually, he was the main reason we have a Bitcoin ETF. Crazy, right? Well, on this one, they didn't vote for that. It was a delegated authority. It means, and this is the most important thing, it means a commissioner, one of the five, can challenge this in the next 10 days. They can challenge us and say, I don't believe this is right. Let's go through the whole process again. And they can delay this even further. So this is something that could happen. But again, who knows if this is a political football? Who knows if this is just pressure someplace else? And we'll go from there. He says, uh, what's really going on here is a, a horse trade of something pro crypto for getting ESG rules in place. ESG rules are being put in place before July 1st. So Trump can challenge them if, if he gets elected. Similar vibes to the FIT Act, which was just passed by the House of Representatives a couple of days ago. FIT 21 went through. Now it has to go through the Senate. And they are saying that it does not look very positive in the Senate, but we'll see. Hell, the Ethereum ETF didn't look too, look, didn't look too positive two weeks ago. And here we are talking about the approval. So I like where things are going, but the question that you have to ask yourself is, is this a good time to start accumulating Ethereum? Now, obviously everybody in the chat's gonna say, well, Rob, genius, it would have been a better time like a year ago, maybe two years ago, or maybe 2016 when it just came out. <laughs> yeah, I gotcha. But the question is, is this a good time to accumulate now? And if you look at the price action, I mean, first of all, when people were saying that really wasn't a big push, it was. <laughs> It was big. Just on May 14th, what's the date today? 24th, 25th, 25th. I mean, nine days ago, it was 2,800. And then it peaked out at 3,900. You could have just sat around in your pajamas and done nothing and made a thousand bucks if you had one Ethereum. Crazy, right? So the question is, could this go higher as we get into it? Potentially could be. It's something a DCA maybe. I, I'm, I'm not your dad. I'm not your financial advisor. It's something that maybe you want to look into. I would also direct your attention to some of the underperforming laggards, which would be the layer two solutions. You can take a look at uh, the optimisms that are out there, the Arbitrum, the Polygon, which I know is a side chain. They're trying to do a ZK roll, thing like that. But take a look at those. Maybe those are something to really add to the portfolio at this point. Again, not telling you what to do, 
but there is some upside because a lot of those layer twos have been underperforming massively. And I think with this ETF, you could see a little bit more action. Anyhow, that's what we have maybe mid-June, maybe some other time. But if you're a DCA or like myself, maybe this is a godsend. It's up to you. But there was one point, and I wanted to bring this to attention. This is why I put Michael Saylor on. It's because of this. Uh, nobody's perfect. Nobody. How many times have I been wrong on here? You can put that in the comment section right now. A lot. A lot, a lot of times that I've been wrong. Uh, both of these ETFs I didn't call correctly. Uh, I think the Bitcoin ETF I said forever would never get approved. Not and uh, sh let me let me let me know when it actually happens, and it got approved. Of course, I was saying that since 2018, but whatever. And then for this one, Ethereum ETF, I was like, probably won't get approved. Got approved. And then of course, let's not forget the Voyager and the Celsius and things like that we used to talk about on this channel. Totally incorrect, right? They worked until they didn't. Having said that, nobody's perfect. I want you to listen to this snippet. This was from. Uh, this is the MicroStrategy uh, conference where they invited a ton of different institutions and business to come about and learn about Bitcoin, about what it could be and what it could do for their balance sheets and moving forward with Bitcoin. But just listen to this. It's about 45 seconds or so. I want you to hear this uh, crystal clear. And here we go. About 45 seconds or so. When Ethereum is not going to be approved, sometime this summer, it'll be very clear to everyone that Ethereum is deemed a crypto asset security, not a commodity. After that, you're going to see that Ethereum, BNB, Solana, Ripple, Cardano, everything down the stack is just a crypto asset security unregistered. None of them will ever be wrapped by a spot ETF None of them will be accepted by Wall Street. None of them will be accepted by mainstream institutional investors as crypto assets. This is the one universal consensus accepted institutional grade crypto asset in the world. There won't be another one when Ethereum is not going to be a. So, look, we don't all get it right. Michael Sarah has been pretty right about Bitcoin. Michael Saylor has been pretty right about things. Michael Saylor so far has been pretty right about even using ordinals for the digital ID. When everybody was poo-pooing all over it, especially the Bitcoin Maximus, he was like, you know what? Ordinals could actually be a very good thing to prove ourselves. So again, in this world of finance and people telling you, you know, do this or take a look at that and maybe you should get into this, just remember that nobody gets it right. And uh, it doesn't matter how many times you are right, no one is perfect, and that's about it. But I will say this. Having said all that, Michael said I was right about one thing. Well, he's been right about many things. So let's, let's, let's give him the credit due, right? He did say ETF comes in, it's gonna be a huge agenda and a huge push forward for Bitcoin and the traditional finance is gonna gobble up Bitcoin. And I just took a look at this. This is from Hodel 15 Capital. I did not know this. And it's pretty amazing to me that you've got, this is the amount of Bitcoin, not in dollars, this is just Bitcoin. That's held by the total U.S. ETFs. Eight, I don't know if you can see that. 855,702. That's America. First of all, two things. This is the total U.S. ETFs. Okay, 855,000. Total global ETFs, as you can see down here, 991,000. So traditional finance, which is, of course, held for their clients and things like that. Sure, I got you. Is almost at 1 million Bitcoin. There's only 21 million to ever be mined. And I got to tell you, I think that roughly between, I don't know, three and a half to six million is already gone. I think we've got another million and a half to, to mine until 2040, maybe 2140, excuse me, 2140. That's a lot. And also what I would like to bring everybody's attention to is this. I know people will say, you know, US isn't the center of the world. I got you. It's not. But boy, there's a boatload of money here. And uh, I do not want to exclude America. And I'm glad that the changes that are going on with both sides of the aisle as they're starting to look towards the future and embrace crypto and digital assets, because let's be honest, it's nice when the bags pump and everything goes up. Anyhow, he was right on that one. Kudos to Michael Saylor. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comments section. And now, <laughs> let's get into Solana. That was a very poor transition, but here's what it is. I found this article very interesting. And I know like when I ever talk, when, every time I talk about Solana, I always get like people who hate it and people who love it. And in the comment section, you will see that both represented today. 
But this was an interesting story and wanted to bring it to everybody's attention. Solana eyes 2025 for Fire Dancer rollout as deep in activity surges. So this Fire Dancer protocol, it's supposed to get uh, rolled out as far as the upgrade in 2025 with pared down versions rolling out before then. What this is gonna allow it to do is to increase the transactions per second and hopefully the stability of the network. Now, having said this, you know that I'm very biased in this channel. I only talk about things that I own. And I own Solana, and I own Bitcoin, and I own Ethereum, and I own Cardano, and I own Optimism, and I own Theta, and I own like 80, I think it's almost 90 different cryptos. Crazy, right? So I'm here with you. If one goes up, I'm happy. If the other one goes down, I'm not too happy. But I will say this before we get into like this deep end narrative. Solana's got problems. And this is from soulscan.io. You can check this out. I'll put it a link in the description, but it's soulscan, S-O-L, scan, S-C-A-N dot I-O. Not scam. I know someone's going to be trying to be funny, but it's not. Soulscan.io. And on there, you can just take a look at all the different on-chain metrics. And something's wrong. Maybe not wrong, but failed transactions. See the success rate right here in purple? That's a very, I mean, 82% is pretty good if you're doing a test, you know, like a, I don't know, just a random test, college or high school. Hey, I got an 82%, congratulations, not 90%, whatever. But for like transactions, success rate, it's not too great. And this is in the last seven days. You have 25% failing. And I can tell you, I can tell you from experience, when I go to bonkrewards.com, yeah, I own Bonk too, shoot me. But with, when I do that, it takes me like three or four times to get through. And yes, I adjusted the slippage all the way up to 2%. So, I mean, this just happens. There's a lot of people using it. There's congestion in the network. I, I don't think we can go outside of that. And someone will say, well, Rob, it's in beta. Well, I get that. How long are we going to be in beta? This is just what it is. We have to talk about the things that are happening right now. Having said all that, I think Solana is great when it works. So this is seven days. Let's roll out to one month. It's not like there was a drop off. It's been having like 20% fail rates, 2025. Let's go three months, bouncing, bouncing around. But since something happened in March, when it was like 90%, 86, 85, almost 90 consistently. And look at this. Let's go all time. As the network started to get flown or get used more and more, you see like success rate go from here. Something happened in March. If someone knows, let me know. 89%, 90%, and it just dropped. And now we're at the 70, 75 range as far as success rates. So yeah, I mean, like a lot's being used. There's a ton of meme coins being bought up. I bought some of them myself, but the point is to make it work and maybe Fire Dance is the answer, but you know, it's not perfect. Nothing's perfect. Nothing's perfect right now. And then also, I want you to notice this, like people talk about the TPS now fastest, pretty damn fast, I must admit, when it's up, or when it's working. But like, you take a look at the vote transactions versus the non-vote transactions. I mean, the majority are vote transactions. What the heck is that? What's the difference? This is what the difference is. Vote transactions are internal transactions submitted by validators. They're used for maintaining consensus. They involve things like validator configuration, registration and voting itself. That's just the consensus part. The non-votes, which are the minority of what the transactions are, those are what we do. Where we like buy NFTs, we transfer soul between accounts, we interact with DeFi applications. So between those two, you have a lot more vote transactions versus non-vote. I'm just saying that's, that's what it is. And to finish up this article, as I got a little rant there, this is, I know people will say, yeah, that's right, Solana. Poof, just wait up. Because on the other side of that, there's always two sides of the coin. Protocols pumping deep in activity in, on Islam include Helium, Hive Mapper, and Render. Analytics show a surge in Hive Mapper mappers in 2024 from around 30,000 to 67,000. Here's the thing about that. Kudos to Helium Mobile. First of all, for transferring from an ERC-20 over to Solana. They did that, smart move. And they actually have a working product. How many of the chains out there have a working product? And like a real working product? And not like it's gonna happen. Hey, Helium Mobile is 20 bucks a month. 
However, however, data is unlimited, but you may experience slowdowns after 30 gigs of data usage. I know that's nitpicky, but I'm just saying. But you can use it right now. And what's interesting about that is did you know that there's three tokens for Helium Mobile? There's three tokens. It's not just Helium. Helium Network token, native currency. There was no pre-mine. It was actually mined. And they switched over to Solana on April 18th. Here's what it does. You get hotspot hosts and operators, and enterprises and developers use the Helium Network to connect devices and build IoT applications. That's the HNT token itself. And if we take a look here, the three, actually, this is HNT. It's actually done pretty well as far as like price appreciation. Of course, this is 2021. It was 51 bucks and it didn't really do much. I mean, there was still some mining and all like that, but look how far it's gone down, like everything else. But if we could just get back to the all time highs, that's like a 10X, 12X, something like that. It's not too bad. So there's that piece. And then there's the IoT network token. I didn't even know this. So I was looking up. IoT token is mined by Iran hotspots through both transfer process as well as proof of coverage. Protocol tokens like IoT will always be backed by HNT and will convert to HNT. And there's also this other one, the mobile network token, Helium Mobile. Protocol token of Helium Mobile Network. Mobile token is mined by the 5G and Wi-Fi hotspots. Protocol tokens like mobile will always be backed by HNT and will convert to HNT. So there's three different tokens. And as far as like price action, you got one here, you got one here. Look at this one. Wow. Helium Mobile was nothing. Then it jumped up here. It's not too far off. Eh, it's kind of far off. You got me on that one. And then Helium IoT for the Internet of Things did pretty well when it launched, went flat. Now it's doing reasonably diff decent. So these are the things that are happening. So with Helium Mobile, I mean, I'm kind of impressed. It does it. I don't have the service. If you do, let me know in the comment section if it's great or if there's some problems. So there's the one thing they talked about as far as the DPIN project. Another one that was interesting is, have you seen this one, Hive Mapper? I got to tip my hat for this one too. This one is essentially, you know, we have like Google Maps, which everybody uses, and that's just mapped by the Google cars that just go around and take pictures and map everything. And they've done a pretty good job globally for the most part. But now you can use this one. And this is a very competitive industry, actually, because if who would you rather want to pay? Like if you're like a like a regular car manufacturer, you know how much they actually have to pay for Google Maps to put that into their cars? It's a boatload. I got an inside person. Anyhow, so like with this one, people are like, well, how does this work? You get a dash cam, put it on your on your car, and you drive around, and you get these honey tokens. No big deal. But when I was taking a look at this, unique, because you can see how much is mapped here. But did you know the percent of global coverage has already been mapped? They've already mapped 21% of the global road network. What the hell happened? That's amazing. So good for Hive Mapper. That's great. Price action, eh? Somewhat, somewhat, but really took a dive. Again, it's actually doing something and doesn't do, <laughs> and the price action goes down. And of course, there's another one they talked about, which was render. And render, instead of going to a centralized place to do to do Web three, excuse me, uh, renderings of and needing GPUs to do different video renders of animation or 3D modeling. You can go here to render, you can sign up, you can do, use it. And then of course the people that actually use the GPUs get paid in render token. I, don't, I couldn't find anything as far as like how much is actually being used. But a funny thing about render token, it's got a great narrative and look what happens. It's the narrative that pushes up, this is all speculation. So again, I think it's just interesting how these things kind of come together. I know I spent a lot of time on that, but that's it for today. It's just kind of putting it out there about what's happening. That's it for today. So look, like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing, everybody talk about it's time sensitive.